But you, Bezalzar, his son, have not humbled yourself through, through you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You have the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drink wine from them. You praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds his hand in your life and all, all your ways. Therefore he sent hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Here's what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. In Paris, uh, your kingdom is divided and given to the Mezin Parisians. Uh, as, I, as I said last week, sometimes when we read the Bible, we, you just read it through. We, we don't have any concept of time. You know, this happened, and then we just think uh, they happened one right after as they were written. But let me put this into context for you. And as I do that, um, let me tell you this. My sermon is about two or three minutes long today. But the introduction is about 15 minutes long. I got to tell you a whole long introduction before I get to the point of the sermon, but the point of the sermon is just going to be a couple things short, all right? So, to put this into time context, this is about 539 BC. Daniel and his other friends were kidnapped about 70 years prior, prior to this. So, Daniel's at least in his 80s now. King Nebuchadnezzar's been dead for 24 years. His grandson, Belshazzar, is the king. The city of Babylon is all that's left of what was the most powerful empire on earth. And they're under siege from the Medo-Persian army. Now, to explain to you what a siege is, an army would come and surround a city and cut it off from all outside communication, outside help, outside supplies, outside food. And they would simply park there until the people inside the city Either all died, or they surrendered. This sometimes took years. And so that's what's going on with Babylon. They're under siege. Things would get bad, so bad sometimes in a city under siege that they would resort to cannibalism just to stay alive. People would eat their children. So that's what's going on. Babylon once part of the most powerful empire on earth, is reduced to a city. And they're under siege. Okay? Now, they're not feeling too stressed out about it, though. They've got a double line of walls, a minimum of 85 feet tall, some of them 100 feet tall. It stretches for 15 miles around the city. they got 100 watchtowers for soldiers to sit up on in case an attack comes. The Euphrates River is running through the city. They have walls built over the river so that they can't send boats in to attack. They have a 20-year stockpile of food and supplies. Plus, with the Euphrates River coming through and the city being so big, they can continually grow crops. They truly believe that nobody can conquer them. They're going to bed in their own beds every night. They're having family reunions. And so confident are they that the king decides to throw a party. As best we can figure out, it's October 12th, 539. He throws a huge party. He invites all the upper crust of the city of Babylon. Their wives, their concubines. And it's guesstimated that there were over 8,000 people at the party. Now, one of the things the king wants to do is he wants to divert attention from the siege. He wants everybody to think everything is wonderful. We're fine. Don't worry. I got it all under control. He wants to boost their morales. Now, well, you need three things to have a party, right? You need food. You need drink. You need a lot of women. And they had plenty of all three. In fact... If we were to just set, call it what it is, we'd just call it a drunken orgy. And they're off to a great start. Everybody's having a great time. The king gets an idea. He says, I'm going to crank this party up. 
He sends his servants into the palace and he said, you know, um, when we captured the temple of Jerusalem, we got the holy goblets that they used in the temple, the gold ones and the silver ones. Go get those. And so they do. And the king drank from them. And his wives drank from them. And his concubines drank from them. And then they begin to pass them around. And then, of course, every drunk thinks they can sing, right? So they begin to sing. They sang to the gods of Babylon. Gold, the gods of gold, silver, stone, and wood. And of course, as wine takes effect, inhibitions disappear. And that's exactly what the king wanted. It turned into a really wild party, and everybody forgot about what was going on outside the walls. Now, interestingly, when the party started, Daniel wasn't there because Daniel wasn't invited. He's over 80 years old now. He's probably already gone to bed. Might be in his room, resting or praying. Why do you want Daniel there anyway? You don't want a godly man in a drunken orgy. Better just to leave him off the guest list. All of a sudden, the party gets crashed by a hand with a finger writing on the wall. There's no body, no head, just a hand. The king becomes pale. He sinks down to his knees. He thinks, oh man, I drank way too much this time. Then he realizes that the whole room has gotten quiet. And it's not a hallucination. Everybody's seeing the same thing. What do the words mean? So the king does what any king would do. He calls in his wise men. He calls in the astrologers. He calls in the enchanters. Now, these guys had secrets that they could use to decipher stuff like this. They'll be able to figure out what the words mean. And the king makes an offer. He says, whichever one of you figures this out, I'm going to make you number three in the kingdom. I'm going to give you a royal robe. I'm going to give you gold. I'm going to, I'm going to make your life great from now on. But they couldn't do it. They all failed, like throwing a wet blanket on the party. When well, another part of the palace, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar's daughter and Belshazzar's mother, you know, she had said, you know, you young people go ahead and party. I've had enough. I'm going to bed. She notices out in the room, there's, I mean, the, the tenor and tone of the whole party had changed. So she goes out to see what's going on, and she too sees the handwriting on the wall. She hears the wise men telling the king, we can't figure out what this is. And she says, you know what? I remember a guy by the name of Daniel. Anytime King Nebuchadnezzar had a problem like this, he called Daniel. And Daniel was able to tell him what the secret was. In fact, that guy could even interpret dreams. God used Daniel because he never compromised his values. Even though Daniel was living in a pagan country, actually working in a pagan government, forced to work there, God used him because he never compromised. Now, I'm going to come forward in history a ways to about 100 years ago. And I want to quote a famous London preacher by the name of Joseph Parker. He said this, When the world throws an orgy, Children of God are not invited. We don't fit in. Our values would just be a nuisance when the world wants to party. But let a marriage break up, or cancer hit, or children get in trouble, or a career hit the rocks. Who do they call? They call the faithful men and women who know the Lord. Daniel wasn't invited to the party, but when God intervened and no one had the answer, suddenly Daniel was the one guy they wanted to hear from. Now, you might feel like the only one in your family or where you work or where you go to school who is trying to live a Christian life. You might be ridiculed for doing so. You might be misunderstood. You might be excluded. But I'll tell you something. When people's lives begin to fall apart, let's take, for example, one of the horrific school shootings that have happened this year. Do they call in the local council of atheists to come and comfort the people? 
No. Do they call in the ACLU? No. Who do they call? God's people. To come and pray. And to comfort. When trouble comes, the people that you know who want nothing to do with God or you because you serve God, they may want you for help. Be ready. Never underestimate the power of a godly life. Okay, back to our story. Belshazzar makes the same offer to Daniel that he made to the other wise men. He says, look, tell me what these four words mean, and I'll give you a robe of royalty. I'll give you a solid gold chain. You'll be the third highest in power in my kingdom. Daniel says, I neither want nor need any of that stuff. He reminds the king of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, which would be Belshazzar's grandfather. He became arrogant, full of pride. God took away his sanity, caused him to crawl around his hands and knees, and eat grass for seven years. He says, God is sovereign over all the affairs of life. But you, Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. He's saying, you should have known better, man. You should have learned from the past. Daniel points out that by drinking from the sacred goblets and praising the gods of Babylon, Belshazzar has set himself against God. Those are very serious words. He has set himself against God. Now, some versions of the Bible have many, many tekel parsons. Some have many, many tekel paris. It means the same thing. And Daniel explains it, and it's short to the point. God has numbered the days of your reign, and your number's up. God has weighed your life in the scales, and you've come up short. Your kingdom is about to be broken up, and your reign is going to end. The message from God is, it's over. His life is going to end soon, and his kingdom is going to be divided up and given to someone else. Now, the end of the story comes pretty fast. In verse 30, it says that Belshazzar was slain that same night. But in the Bible, we don't have any details of how that happened. But secular history tells us how that happened. The Medo-Persian army got an idea. Let's divert the Euphrates River and have it run into a nearby lake. Then, on the riverbed, we can go in and take the city. And that is exactly what they did. See if this sounds familiar. Babylon became great because of the blessing of God. When they became great, their pride made them forget God. When they forgot God, they began to take Him for granted. When they took Him for granted, God judged them, and they were no longer a great nation. What happened to them can happen to us. There have been great empires who thought that they were invincible who have come and gone. This one, the Medo-Persians, Greece, Rome, the Communist Empire, Hitler's Third Reich, all thought themselves invincible and they're all gone. See, here's how it usually happens. A nation begins to believe that they will always be a superpower. They slowly begin to push God out of the picture and out of public life and forbid the mention of his name. Well, sure, Pastor, we would like you to open the city council meeting in prayer, but please, don't say Jesus. I'm sorry, Coach, we have to fire you. You can't lead voluntary prayer in the middle of the football field anymore. I used to be a, a member and a participant of the Twin City Ministerial Association. And after the September 11th attack, you know, a lot of people started to come back to church. And, and uh, the Twin City Ministerial Association, um, which had once been led by a very godly man by the name of Tom Wicket, who was at the North Tonawanda United Methodist Church, and, uh, uh, and he was replaced. And uh, we got a new president. And uh, at one of our meetings, they started talking about, well, we need to have a public service uh, in order to bring the people 
of the Tarawandas together. And we need to hold a public prayer service. We'll hold it in the gazebo over here at uh, Clint, Clint, Clinton Park. Is that what it's called? Yes, Clinton Park. Well, one of the pastors in the group spoke up and he said this. Now, you know, this is shortly after 9-11, okay? So this is 14 years ago. Twin City Ministerial Association is dissolved and you won't be surprised when I finish this story. One of the local pastors spoke up and he said, uh, I, think it's, I think it's great that we're going to hold this, but I need to make a suggestion. All right? The guy's name was Tom. Okay? All right, Tom. When we do this, we don't want to offend the Muslims. So we better not say the name of Jesus. I spoke up. And here's what I said. I am operating under the presumption that everybody in this room is a Christian minister, which means we follow Christ. Quite frankly, I don't even know if we have any Muslims living in the Tonawandas. If we do, I don't know that they would be attending a service sponsored by the Twin City Ministerial Association. But putting all that aside, You want us to deny the name of Jesus? <clears throat> if you go ahead and do this, I want you to know I will not participate. Because nobody's ever going to tell me I can't speak the name of Jesus. Oh, well, I tell you, you can tell me. <laughs> but it's not going to stop me. Well, not surprisingly, that service never happened. Do you see the correlation I'm making here? Our country has for a long time been going down the road of marginalizing people who follow God and serve Christ. There are people whose goal is to remove God, to remove any reference to Jesus from our society totally. Get the Ten Commandments away from the front of the courthouse. Don't say the name of Jesus when you pray. I've known people, or not personally known, but have, have seen reports of people who have a little plastic cross in their cubicle at work and told they had to remove it. It was offensive. Let me say again what I said earlier. A nation begins to believe that they will always be a superpower will then slowly begin to push God out of the picture, take him out of public life, forbid the mention of his name, ridicule those who believe in him, remove absolutes, rewrite the rule book, live by our own set of rules. Over time, as we take God for granted, we turn to our own idols and worship the things we made with our own hands. In time, God will judge that nation and it will no longer be great. And note this biblical fact. God often raises up another nation to judge that one. Now, that's the end of the introduction. Now I'm going to start the sermon, which is not long. I think the United States of America has drunk, drank and is still drinking out of two sacred cups. The sanctity of life and the sanctity of marriage. The word sanctity means holy. In God's eyes, life is holy. And in God's eyes, marriage, the way he wants it, is holy. Let me talk about life first real quick. 1973, Roe v. Wade was enacted in our country. And over the course of the years, it has turned into what now? Planned Parenthood selling the parts of aborted babies for money and profit. And you say to yourself, that can't possibly get any worse, but let me tell you what is in the works. And 
You can research this and find it out for yourself. There are people in our current government who are advocating for abortion up to age two. Now you say, wait a minute. You're, you're killing the child. Yeah. I believe if, if you have an abortion when you're going to pray, you're killing the child. Wait a minute. That baby's already been born. They're a year and a half old. Yeah, but the person who's pushing hardest for it, this is their argument. A child isn't really self-aware until after the age of two. So if you were to end their life, they're not really going to know the difference. Now you say to yourself, that'll never happen, that can't happen. If I'd have told you five years ago that we would one day be talking about Planned Parenthood selling the parts of aborted babies, what would you have said? That'll never happen. All right, let me tell you the second cup. Marriage. It started with free love in the 60s, then it went to no-fault divorce. Then it went to take a test drive first and live together before getting married. Then now we're at same-sex marriage, and guess what the next thing up <coughs> on the platter is? We well, see I can't really control who I love, so I love him and her and her. And I think the four of us should be able to get there. And why would you stop that if you have redefined what marriage is? And don't say, that can never happen. There are lawsuits going on now to try to make that happen. You see, we as a country, and I'm not talking about you or me, but we as a country, because this is where we live, we have taken what God calls holy and we're using it for our collective no-holds-barred party and judgment is coming and perhaps has already begun. Now, I wouldn't be a preacher worth my weight in salt if I talked about, if I preached about judgment and didn't offer hope, and this is what I want to do. Today, now is the accepted time, and today is the day of salvation. It doesn't matter a lick of what you have done before 11.42 a.m. this morning in your past. God is ready to forgive you. This day can start a new, a new life, a new start with the Lord. This is the day to be forgiven. And to forgive. Changing our nation starts with changing our hearts. Is that what you want? Let's pray. Lord, I think in many ways the church, which is us, and millions of other people who follow you, we've been lulled to sleep. We've given up and given way one little thing after another, one little thing after another. And I don't know how long you've tolerated. Maybe you're not tolerating. Maybe things are happening that we're aware of and some that we aren't. But I know that no matter what the situation is with decisions that people over our heads make, there's an important decision each of us need to make, and that is to confess our sins because you are faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and show our love for you by doing what you command. Please help us to do that.